Turn your Bibles to John chapter 11, verses 3 through 6 is what we're going to start with today. Are y'all ready for the Word of God? Amen. Does it drive you crazy when people are late? Does it drive you crazy when people show up late? Two of you, okay, all right. Are you late from time to time? Come on, where's my late people at? There they are, there they are, all right. Where's all my liars in church at? All right, go ahead, raise your hand. Because some of y'all, y'all know you're late. Every day late, hallelujah. Uh, a lot of times what happens when, when we experience someone being late in our lives, maybe uh, we feel like it's an emergency. Have you ever had an emergency in your life, but you feel like someone didn't show up in time? Okay. So that's what I want to talk to you about uh, today because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, right? No matter what your situation is, uh, he brings you back to life. Here we are today celebrating many uh, baptisms and people coming to the knowledge of Christ. And I want to tell you, those people that just walked through that tank, there's probably times in their life they didn't know if Jesus was going to show up. But the enemy just thought he had you. But Jesus said you were his. Come on now. Right? So... Today we're going to talk about an on-time God, because that's what Jesus is. He shows up right on time, but in this story that we're going to read about today, it doesn't look like he showed up when he should have showed up, and that's what we're going to talk about, John eleven three 3 through 6. It says this in verse 3. I'm going to elaborate on verse 3 just for a moment. Therefore the sisters, sisters being Mary and Martha, their brother was sick. Their brother's name was Lazarus. I don't know if you all know this, but Lazarus was sick, and it actually caused death in his life. But check it out. Jesus has a different perspective than we have. So the sister sent to him, him being Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. You ever been manipulated before? <laughs> you ever had somebody call you and go, hey, you know, I was there for you and you need to be there for me. And I, You know, you, you need to show up right now. And they want you there right then, right then, right then. There, now, this is exactly what Jesus is dealing with because the sisters, they sent word to Jesus. I don't know how they got the word to Jesus on parchment paper. I have no idea if they, they got it to him just through word of mouth. I'm not really for sure. But here's what she said. She said, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. It, she didn't say Lazarus is sick. She said, he whom you love is sick. So in other words, Jesus, this is more important than anything you got going on in your schedule right now. I know you're on a little journey. You're out there on your little preaching circuit. And you're going around and you're teaching everybody about everything. But I want you to know today that he whom you love is sick. Verse 4. Let's go on to that. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Now, we, we, I just spilled the beans while ago. We kind of know the story, right? The story of Lazarus is that he actually died of this sickness. This was not a sickness that ibuprofen or Tylenol could take care of. This was not anything minor. This was a major sickness, apparently, because this dude died. But Jesus, again, has a different perspective because he said, Hey, guys, look, I understand that you're saying that he is sick. But this sickness, this is where you got to stand on the Word of God. Amen. Amen. I'm teaching you something today. This is where you have to stand on the Word of God. This sickness is not unto death. Now, I want to tell you, it may look dead. It may seem like it. But this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Verse 5. And he makes a statement, this right here, this is written in red in your Bible. So this is, this is all these things that, that we heard about with Jesus, right? Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So what's about to happen has nothing to do with love. Amen. What's fixing to go down has nothing to do with the love of God. Who can separate you from the love of God? Nobody. Nobody. I've always quoted that scripture. Actually, this week, I w it was a revelation to me. I'm reading uh, 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 the Bible, and I come across Romans chapter 8, where it says, who can separate you from the love of God? And I go, well, I always quote that as what can separate you from the love of God. It's not a what, it's a who. How many of you know who is behind all the what's that's happening in your life? 
Nothing can separate them. Jesus is saying right here, clear as day, he's saying, hey, I love Martha, I love her sister, I love Lazarus, verse 6. So when he heard that he was sick, he, he left what he was doing, dropped everything at the drop of a dime, got on his ostrich and ran back to the place in which Lazarus laid sick on his bed down at Vanderbilt, and he touched his body and healed him, and he got up and was healed from that moment on and testified unto all the people that Jesus loves him and healed his body. Oh, that ain't what the G, that ain't what it said? Oh, okay, that, that's the JGV. Okay, I'm sorry, that's the Jamie Grisham version. Here, here, here's the real version. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. He stayed two more days. This is when Jesus becomes a little confusing to me. I'm like, come on, Jesus, if you really love somebody, you would show up for them pretty immediately, wouldn't you? You would show up for them, right? There's something in us that thinks if, say if, if, if Jesus loves us, then when we, ha we, we have this get out of jail free card, like we play a Monopoly or something, with Jesus, we got, we got a get out of jail free card when it comes to pain, trials, tribulation, persecution, things going on in our life. I'll just go ahead and blurt it out as a pastor. Don't think that I'm a, a, a man that has little faith. I've got a lot of faith, healing, sickness. We can't get sick because Jesus loves me. I wouldn't be sick like this. I wouldn't have to go through some of this stuff. Well, Jesus loved this guy. Right? C.S. Lewis, do y'all know who C.S. Lewis is? C.S. Lewis was once asked, he, he was asked this, why do righteous people suffer? Why do the righteous suffer? Have you ever thought about that? Why, why do the people, if this guy had such a relationship with Jesus in the flesh, I mean, surely Jesus could have just dipped his hand in oil one day and popped his forehead and said, no sickness shall ever harm you uh, for the rest of your life because you are my best friend. Why do the righteous suffer? In which C.S. Lewis replied, because they're the only ones who can handle it. Amen. They're the only ones that can handle it. They're the only ones that have the spirit of life on the inside of them. They're the only ones that have this deep personal relationship with Jesus Christ that believe God in his fullness, healed or not healed. It doesn't matter suffering or not suffering. It doesn't matter mountaintops or valley lows. It doesn't matter. It's an unconditional relationship that we have with Jesus, right? I mean, surely you have this, Jesus has unconditional love for you. Surely you have an unconditional relationship with Jesus. Surely. Surely your relationship is not based on something that God can do for you, and if he don't do that for you, then you kind of squirrel or, or crawdad yourself out of different situations with God. But the interesting thing about this story is when he hears about the sickness. When he hears about the sickness, this dude hangs out for a little bit. He tarries. Come on. Hey, what'd y'all say? Oh, Lazarus sick? Oh, that sickness ain't unto death, but it's for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be revealed. Amen. I'm good. Y'all good? Y'all tell Mary and Martha, just send back word that I'm good. Amen. I'm God. I'm Jesus. I know what's happening. I know what's up. So here's what I'm going to do. My journey here and my task here and what I need to do in this area, in this region that I'm in, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing right here for a couple more days. I know it's a two-day journey back to where they're at, but I'll be back. Just tell them I'll be back. It's okay. Amen. Anyway, don't you know that if you have a loved one or someone that is really close to you, and they are sick, and they are in desperate need, we feel like that we have to rush to them. If your parent is alive right now, and your parent texts you right now and said, this is an emergency, stop what you're doing, and leave and come to me right now, you would not care who around you seen you walk up out of church, you wouldn't care about interrupting a sermon, or neither would I care if you did. 
you would get up out of your seat, you would walk out those double doors, you would get in your vehicle, and you would go straight to your parent, your sibling, whoever that is, because it's desperate, and they are in need, and they are hurt, and they need you right on the spot. You are the Savior. You're their saving peace. Y'all with me? So you are the saving peace. You would go, not Jesus. Jesus would get the text on his eye watch, and he'd go, oh, that's cool. And he'd sit back, and he would wait. Because when the message reached Jesus, he did what? He waited. He waited. He stayed two days longer. Maybe you're in the two-day period with Jesus right now, and you're about to give up. You're about to say, my gosh, man, I thought, hold on a minute. I thought this says that Je Jesus loves me. Do you remember the little nursery rhyme or whatever you want to call it back in Sunday school? that we Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones whom him belong, they are here strong. Yes, Jesus may sometimes love me. Yes, if Jesus wants to, he'll love me. That's not what he said. No, yes, Jesus loves me. He didn't rush. He didn't run. He didn't even heal. Do you know that Jesus could heal in a moment? Boom, just like that. He could just heal in a moment. Do you remember the centurion? Right? He meets Jesus along the way, and he says, hey, I need you to heal. I think it was his son. Was it his son, the centurion? Didn't he have a son or a daughter? It was one of the two. It was, it was, his, it was his kid. So he goes, uh, my, my kid is sick, but I, I, don't, I don't need you to personally go. All I need you to do, I'm a man under authority also. All I need you to do is speak the word, and if you'll speak the word, he will be healed. That's all I need. Jesus didn't even speak the word. He didn't even say, hey, Lazarus, be healed. Hey, he's good. Don't worry about it. He didn't do that. He didn't heal from a distance. You know what he did? He waited. It frustrates us when Jesus moves too slow. Okay, let me say that another way. It frustrates me when Jesus moves too slow. I don't know about you, but Jesus has moved a little slow in my life in some areas. Sometimes I'm like, golly, God, man, I'm sitting here, I'm giving my life for you, I've sacrificed a lot of stuff for you, I'm, I'm pouring my life day in and day out, I have done so much for you, why can you not show up in this moment? I have those prayers, I don't know if you think I do, but I do. It frustrates us when Jesus moves too slow, and here's why it frustrates us, we want his hand. His hand is all of his blessings, all the mercy and the grace and the favor and all the stuff. We want his hands, but we don't want his calendar. We don't. <laughs> I love this guy. We want his hand, but we don't want his calendar. We don't want his time frame. Because you have to understand that God's timing and your timing are two totally different times. Right? He may not come, he may not come uh, uh, when you want him, right? But he'll be there right on time. <laughs> y'all remember that song? I, I remember, dude, y'all don't even understand. I was raised Southern Baptist, and I got a little Pentecostal in me. I ain't going to lie. Because <laughs> somebody said, hallelujah, you know. The Baptists are just being quiet right now. They're like, we ain't even supposed to talk in church. Shut up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they, they, they so, but, but it's okay. I can talk about Baptists because I, I, I'm a Bapticostal, you know, I, I guess, whatever. But I can remember the first Pentecostal church I ever went to, it was an international Pentecostal holiness church. Now, when, don't, don't let that word holiness flip you out because it, it wasn't a oneness church. A lot of people, you know, oneness church, believed in the Trinity, all that stuff. So the theology was awesome. Theology was really great. Uh, but I remember going to this church, when I went to this church, man, this pastor, I've never seen a pastor. I came from a Baptist church. So the Baptist church guy, he just kind of gets up, opens up his Bible, talks a little bit. We go home. That's just kind of how it was. But this Pentecostal guy, he had a handkerchief. Actually, it wasn't a handkerchief. It was a washcloth. 
And he'd have his washcloth in one hand and his microphone in the other. And he'd have this growl in his voice. Uh, and you'd have to start uh, saying, huh, after ever, I thought he was speaking pig Latin at first. Uh, I didn't know what he was saying. Uh, and he would start preaching. Uh, and I was like, my gosh, uh, I like this. Uh, Jill, I think we're going to keep coming to this uh, church. Uh, you know, that's just kind of what. And, and he would jump up on the pews. We had these wooden pews. By the way, I ended up pastoring that church. Yeah, I ended up pastoring that church. He'd jump up on the pews, and he would walk the pews. He'd run the pews. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It wasn't like jumping from in the seat to the next seat. It was like jumping from the back of the pew to the next back of the pew. I'm like, you can't even do that in a chair church. You'd be falling on your face in a chair church. But in a pew church, come on in. And I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm going, wow. you know. And that's the only thing that I knew. I mean, I'm talking about Pentecostal and stuff. And, and, and uh, I got to pastoring that church. And the only way that I knew to preach, because that was the only pastor that I had come up on, is I knew to preach in a three-piece suit. Come on, somebody. I ought to, I ought to wear a three-piece suit. I would do a throwback one Sunday. I had this purple suit. It was my favorite suit. It was a pinstripe suit. Come on, somebody. I had me some white alligator shoes. Come on now. Come on. I had me some shoes. I had my handheld microphone and a wash rag. I never sweated, but I would always pat my forehead. Y'all think I'm laughing and making jokes and being fun, but this is the truth. And we would get to breaking out, and I'm talking about this Pentecostal church was so out of order. And I was leading it. <laughs> it's before I even read the Bible, really, to be honest with you. I was so young. And I'm leading this church, and we're running around and doing all that, but we would have this song that we would break out into. Y'all can't handle the song. And it, it would go something like, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. Because he's an on time. God, yes, he is. Whoa, ho, ho, he's an old time God. Woo. Yes, he is. Well, he may not come when you want him. Right on time. He's an old time God. Yes, he is. Come on, choir. Break into the enemy's camp. Hallelujah. Well, I went to the enemy's camp. Y'all remember that, right? And you couldn't sing that song without saying, and I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. Y'all know what I'm saying. On time God. Just, just getting so fired up, so excited. We say God's an on time God. We don't even sing about it. What is on time for Jesus? Four days late, dead and stinking. That's right on time. Because Look, if you can sing that song, when Jesus done showed up four days late in your life, come on, that thing that you've been praying for is dead and your life stinks. And you can still sing, he's an on time God, he's about to show up in your life. You say, why? Why does he show up four days late, dead, stinking? Here's why. Because the glory of God will be revealed, can be seen, so that the glory of God can be seen. Look, it's his glory that makes him famous, not your healing. It's the depth of who he really is, not what he's doing for you. Come on. <laughs> We make everything so personable. 
Well, let me tell you what God did for me. Well, keep testifying. We're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Keep testifying. But don't you put yourself in there too much because without God, you wouldn't have come out of that addiction. Without God, your marriage would have ended in divorce. Without God, come on, somebody. Without God. Let's keep on. Y'all don't pull the preach out of me today. Hey. All right. John eleven thirty eight. Then Jesus... We're skipping down to verse 38. You've got to go back, and, and that's your assignment today, this week. Go back and read John 11. Then Jesus, again, groaning in himself, now he's already showed back up at the tomb. He's four days later. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. You better watch it when Jesus starts speaking. Because if you don't watch it, you'll start doubting the very words that Jesus is trying to speak into your life. Because now, after all of this mess... They've buried the guy, and Jesus finally shows up. And I think Jesus shows up after we bury a thing because now we have nothing to do with it. We've been trying to nurse that thing and nurture that thing and get that thing, you know, back to life for, forever. But Jesus is like, nope, let it die. Let it die. I will show up when everything is dead. And when everything's dead, I am, he told uh, Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and life. It may look dead to all of you guys, but I am the resurrection and the life. But look, here's what it says. Take away the stone. Jesus is authoritative. Take away the stone. I want you to take away the stone. And then Martha, somebody say Martha. Martha. Now, say your name right now. Instead of Martha, say your name. Please. All right, Chris. Chris, the sister of him. Who was it? I'm just kidding. All right, Martha, listen to this. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, because we always think we know better than God. Amen. Take away the stone. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. no, 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 no. Now, hold on a minute. Now, hold on a minute. We done signed the papers. God, you don't understand. Oh, really? God don't understand? What's wrong with you? But here's what she says. She says, hold on a minute. Lord, by this Time, someone say time. time. By this time, because we're always putting a time limit on what God can do. You don't understand. But God, by this time, here we are, God, by this time, there's a stench. But you don't understand. He's been dead for four years days. Now, in the natural, we all know that it would have been easier for Jesus to come to sick Lazarus and heal him than to stinky and dead Lazarus and raise him from the dead. Here's where the story gets very clear to me. Verse 43. Let's go back to verse 43. Now, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come forth. The very thing that they've already wrapped up in grave clothes, put in a tomb, rolled the stone in front of the tomb and said, he's dead. Already had the funeral. I can't believe you wasn't here. You never showed up. He speaks to that very thing and he says, Lazarus, come forth. Exclamation point in your Bible, authoritative. Because that's the God that we serve. We serve a God of authority. Lazarus, come forth. Now this is where it gets really good. Verse 44. It gets really good. And he who had died came out bound. Say bound. bound. Who bound him? His sisters. The very people that wanted him healed. If you don't watch it, you'll be tying the hands of God with your words, with your thoughts, with your actions. And the very thing he wants to call out, you've wrapped up. Because he was bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. But Jesus, this is a good one, said to them, say them, who was them? Mary and Martha. Jesus said to them, 
loose him and let him go. Now, why did Jesus get to this point? Raise the man from the dead and not loose him and let him go himself. I think Jesus is teaching us all a lesson. And I think in this moment, what Jesus is saying is, the same faith that you should have had, that the lack of it caused you to wrap him up, I want you girls to get over there and cry like a baby as you untie that boy. And you unravel that unbelief, that lack of faith, all of that stuff that you had in your life because I just declared to you that I am the resurrection and the life. So there's this object lesson with a miracle and a healing that has just taken place. And Jesus looks at these people and says, loose him and let him go. And could you imagine, as they were unwrapping him, the thought process that they had in their mind going, why didn't we believe Jesus in the first place? The very thing that I thought was dead is now alive. I believe that's a prophetic utterance for some of you, that you're going to start unwrapping some things that you wrapped up. Come on. Come on. You're going to start unwrapping some things that you've wrapped up. And as you're unwrapping it, your faith is going to build because God is going to show you in a dead, stinky moment who he really is. My gosh, y'all got me to preaching today. Woo. Then many of the Jews, verse 45, this is the key part. The many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did. Listen, listen, believed in him. Hold on a minute, let's go back, let's go back. For this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be revealed. Now these people who are mourners, do you know that in, in biblical times they would pay mourners? So they would pay mourners to come and be at the funeral and people would just come. So like weeping mourners would show up to the funeral because it was a sorrowful moment. So all you could hear probably at the tomb was, <laughs> and here they are and Jesus is like, just wipe your tears. I am here. I am God and I'm the resurrection and life. Come on, this is, this is, oh my gosh, this is so good. Because when Jesus doesn't come when you call him, something greater is on the horizon. So if right now you're in a moment where Jesus is not coming, he's not showing up, you've been praying, I'm talking about seeking and praying, could you imagine what it felt like to be Joseph? To have a dream on the inside of you and then to share that dream prematurely to your brothers? You better watch what you share with brothers and sisters in Christ because they may get jealous and try to kill you for it. That's a whole nother sermon for another day. But he, but, he, but he shares it. Then he shares it with his dad. And his dad gets a little offensive and like, oh, my gosh. But he pondered it in his heart. What does this mean that the sun and the moon is going to bow down to him, which represented the, his mother and father, and they're bowing down to this child, and, and he's the youngest of the bunch. I mean, my gosh. But how do you think Joseph felt when he, when he ran up on his brothers with his little coat of many colors and he shows up on the scene and they hate him and they throw him into a pit to die? But God, I thought, I thought you gave me a dream. I thought, I thought that I had a different plan for my life. No, you're in the pit. Oh, by the way, Judah, praise, is going to pick you up because there's some merchants coming by and, and, and there's, there's slave traders and they're going to sell you into slavery. Slavery? What do you mean? My man for slavery goes into Potiphar's house, becomes ruler of Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him and, and, and now he's sitting in prison. Prison? But I have a dream. Come on. I have this thing that God has told me, and I've been praying, and I've been seeking God. And now I've been falsely accused. I've been thrown into a pit, uh, expected to die. I've been sold into slavery. And now I'm interpreting these things for these people with this gift of God that God's given to me. And I've interpreted some dreams for these people, and these people don't even remember me. Where are you at, God? Fourteen years later, that dream come to fruition. Come on, we can't even wait two weeks for God. 
two weeks in this culture seems like a lifetime. Well, if God was going to heal my mama, he would have already healed my mama. No, your mama will be healed one way or the other, just like my daddy will be healed. My daddy's got cancer, he's had cancer for three years. I don't understand why God just won't touch his body and heal his body, but I know this, whether my dad gets his healing on this earth or if he gets his healing in heaven, he will be healed in the name of Jesus. That's why Jesus died on the cross for us. What was, she, what was Jesus showing them and what is Jesus showing us? Here's what I think it is. A resurrection is better than a healing. I know you and your wife is spouting off at each other and it's kind of fighting and you're doing some stuff and y'all going through a little rough patch. That's why they got therapists. They got marital therapists. You got marital coaching here at the church. You got different avenues that you can do. That's great. But, but you know, maybe God's not coming in and touching and healing your marriage. Maybe God needs that thing to get really bad. He needs it to stink. And when it finally stinks, you know that you're not in control of this marriage, and she knows that she's not in control of this marriage, and now you've got to depend on somebody that you hadn't depended on your whole marriage, and his name's God, and he'll resurrect that thing and make it stronger than it's ever been. But it's got to stink a little bit first. That thing's got to look dead first. Come on. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, if I heal your brother, three people's going to feel good. Three. Your brother's going to feel real good. You're going to feel good. And your sister's going to feel good. If I heal your brother, three people's going to be, be good. But if I resurrect your brother, many will believe. We, we literally learn from this story that there is a divine strategy with unanswered prayer. Y'all with me? Divine. It's a divine strategy. Have you ever prayed something and then years later you go, oh my gosh, I am so glad that God didn't answer that prayer. Raise your hand right now. Raise your hand. My goodness, church, you better look around. You better watch what you're praying for. There was a theologian decades ago. There was a theologian decades ago. He come out with this, um, with, with just this little thing and he said um, this in, in his little theology piece. He said, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Amen. Yeah, the theologian was Garth Brooks. That's exactly who it was. Any Garth fans in the room? All right, all right, all right three of you. It's okay. We love you, Garth. If you're watching, uh, pull up the giving slide real quick. <laughs> Just kidding. I was talking about Garth. Okay, anyway. But he writes this song, and he says, just the other night, at a hometown football game, my wife and I bumped into my old high school flame. And as I introduced them, the past came back to me, and I couldn't help but think of the way things used to be. And he starts reminiscing. And then by the end of the song, or the end of the little verse, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. I remember. remember. Huh? What? Somebody give this girl a microphone right now in the name of Jesus. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Listen, one of God's greatest gifts to Mary and Martha was to not heal their brother. That's the greatest gift. Now, do you think in the moment or at the funeral that Mary and Martha thought that that was the greatest gift from Jesus? They're a really, really good friend. No. That's where we don't understand God. We don't get it. But He's got it. See, our prayers, if we don't watch it, are for our well-being. But God sees bigger things. Don't pray selfish prayers. Don't do it. Just believe and trust God. Amen? Let me pray with you today. Father, this service has been amazing. I pray that the same anointing, the same presence, everything, God, that we've experienced in this service 
will just flow over. There's something special about this service that it'll just flow over into our other services. Let your peace and joy and love rule and reign in our lives. But more than anything today, God, would you teach us patience? God, we want your hands, but we don't want your calendar. Your calendar really trips us out, God, to be honest. It causes us to just doubt ourselves. It causes us to doubt our prayers at times. It causes us to doubt prayer warriors and people, and it causes us to doubt the church. And, but God, let us not look at those things. Let's look unto the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth, and know that he has a better plan than we have. Pray it all today in Jesus' name. Amen.